Because Matt, I might explain a little bit differently, hopefully, um, to give you a bit, a bit more of a, a different view on things. Um, as you know, I've been at Disney for, well, as you may not know, I've been at Disney for about eight years, and I've just come here two or three months, we've been here about two or three months now. So it's exciting. I'm really looking forward to uh, doing some new stuff, doing some, maybe some more you know, cartoony type animation movies, stuff with a bit more edge to it. Anyway, today um, I'm going to talk about mechanics, the, the basics of motion, how motion, how movement works, why it works the way it does. I might get a little technical at times, but don't worry about that. It's just one of the cool things that I like to talk about. Um, okay, and I'll be showing some some clips later on. And in the next weeks, I'll be talking about planning. Planner, and you'll see how to approach them, and so you get the, the most out of them. I'll be talking about locomotion, especially. I'll be talking about acting and dialogue, but that's over like the next six weeks. But today I'll be talking mainly about mechanics, and I'm going to try and sort of skew it slightly towards um, towards animating people because that's what a lot of us are going to be doing. Uh, not only on Prince of Egypt, but El Dorado too. It's mostly cast of human characters. That way. Okay, so mechanics, the basics. Um, I suppose a lot of you that have read animation books will have seen like a list, a list of ten or so rules that you have to put into your animation, like this um, slow ins and slow outs, drag and follow between, and uh, things called successive breakage of joints. And all these little rules. Um, which you look at and think, gosh, what if I forget what my animation is going to start? Um, it's really a little bit more simple than that. A lot of these rules um, really boil down to an overall theory of how things move and why they move the way they do. Um, and really, most of them, uh, most of them can be applied to this word, inertia. Now, um, inertia in physics, well, in Newtonian physics, um, is defined by two laws. Two laws. Two laws. Um, two laws, which is, if you simplify them, says that once something is stopped, it doesn't want to move, and once it's moving, it doesn't want to stop. That's Newton says it a little bit more complicated. But those are like the two basic, basic rules. And that's inertia, really. And those two rules really explain away a lot of separate animation rules that we get. Like take slow ins and slow outs. Um, meaning, of course, the spacing that you put on your drawings to accelerate or decelerate. So the sort of spacing you put on drawings to make them get faster or slow down. Um, this happens because at this point you're still you're not moving and you don't want to move. That's what inertia is. Right. Once it stops, it doesn't want to move. So it takes time, over time, it takes time for you to build up speed. Similarly on the other end, if you're already moving, you know, in other words you're drawing your spacing at such a pace, it takes time for you to slow Moving that really explains all of slow ins and slow outs. Everything in nature accelerates and decelerates at some point. Even in an impact, you know, where you might think, well, there's no deceleration there, it just stops instantaneously. Um, there are physical equations to explain that. And it does actually slow down, but it's much quicker than a 24 speed. So, in our Act like that, it is instantaneous. There's no slowing or slow out. In reality, the microscopic one slows down because it happens faster than the drawings that we're dealing with instantaneously. Yeah. Everything else demands this kind of treatment where you take time to get moving and time to stop. Okay, 
drag and follow through. It's the same kind of thing. When we're talking about drag and follow through, we mean that certain parts of um, a body or an object, especially one that is loosely <coughs> jointed or floppy, we tend to stay behind when an action is initiated, like that, and then when the action stops, we still tend to keep moving. If I had a cloak on, like that, and I started to move this way, you would see the cloak start to stay where it was until it couldn't anymore, and it would start dragging behind me. And then if I stopped suddenly, it would keep going and follow through. That's drag and follow through. And it happens on anything that is loosely jointed or floppy. In other words, clothing, hair, feathers, uh, even the flesh on your face. You can do a certain amount of drag and follow through depending on what kind of character you feel. Like cartoony characters, they like the dwarves or something, so they're white. Um, have a lot more drag and <coughs> follow through in their face, it's sort of flesh. The bones might move underneath it, but the flesh might stay behind like that. Uh, <laughs> um, Um, a lot of you might have seen, oh yes, let's go to weight and balance. It also affects weight and balance if you're dealing with people, especially. Um, when I'm standing still, I have to be in balance. Otherwise, I'm going to fall over. Uh, if I take, just take the weight off one of my feet, that puts me off balance, because now the weight is on that foot only, and of course, by wasting that foot, it's going to fall over. So, being still means you have to be in balance. Conversely, being in motion means you have to be <laughs> off balance. <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> right. Sorry, Um. Being in motion, or especially getting into and out of motion, means you have to put yourself off balance. So, even if I'm like this, I'm still in balance, because I'm leaning on the chair, and the weight is not only going through my legs, but also through the chair. If I didn't have the chair there, you know, the results would be obvious, I would just fall. And that really, um, putting yourself off balance is the first step getting moving. If you don't have any live action, even if you do have live action to base some realistic animation on, um, I see a lot of animation of people starting to walk, which doesn't look right, because they're basically standing there, and then suddenly they're moving. It's almost as if they're being pulled on a string. Um, now there are several techniques to getting a body moving stopping it. You have to, in other words, give yourself enough time to get moving. If I was just to take the weight off this foot very subtly, you know, it takes me time to fall into that walk. Give me this kind of spacing. Um, if I wanted to get moving very much more quickly, I'd have to put myself off balance more. In other words, a good way to do it you just got a guy, excuse me, sorry. Um, if you've just got a guy and you want him to start moving that way, he's got his foot over here, so it's kind of difficult for him to get over that foot. You know, he would really have to push up on this leg to sort of get himself over that foot. A good way to start walking is just to take the weight off of that foot, like that. He puts all his weight on that one back there and makes him fall forward into the action. So he puts his feet, you just take one off, and you fall into it. If he wanted to start running really fast, right from the word go, what real people do is they actually take that foot and skip it out to there. You actually do that, and you can go like I just did. Very much faster, very much so it's the degree that you put yourself off balance um, dictates the speed or the speed of the accelerator. And the same applies to stopping too. If I'm just uh, going at a fairly reasonable rate, you won't see much.
much of a lean back when I stop, but there is one that's very slight. If I'm running, you know, really fast, you notice I have to really put my feet out in front of me in order to stop. <coughs> it's like it's like bouncing a pencil across a table. You bounce, you like throw a pencil across the table, and it hits the table like this, something like that. It tends to go one straight up. If it hits that, it skips along, and that's because when I, exactly the same as a human body. So when pencil or the human body wants to stop, it leans backwards like that. So if I'm running and I want to stop, you find yourself overstriding, in other words, putting your feet out so slightly in front of you. The same applies um, to changing direction. Um, if you want to run and jump up, what happens if you watch film of high jumpers or anything, they tend to put on the last two steps, or the last step especially, they put their foot way out in front of them. Like the last frame before they take off, their foot is way out here. Now, when they're gaining acceleration, the feet strike under the body, like that, so they're sort of leaning back forward, then to make that motion go into height, they bounce like a pencil. Weight of their limbs to swing through to get the height. Exactly the same applies to turning corners. You also see a lot of animation where characters will turn corners and it doesn't look quite right because they're really not leaning into it. And you don't obviously have to lean with your entire body, but the foot placement is very, very critical. Because the faster you're going, the more you have to lean. And that's like riding a bicycle or a motorcycle. We have to lean the bike. <coughs> and it's easier, I'll go over this again <coughs> in a locomotion lecture, but it's easier to use your outside leg and change direction. Football players and um, they often use the outside leg because it really puts my weight completely off balance. Completely off balance. This all comes back to inertia again. It's all because I have this inertia in my body, because my, the weight of my body is moving, that I have to put my feet out, because it doesn't want to stop. If I didn't put my feet out, I wanted to stop. If I could do that, I would pitch right over, because the weight in my body wants to keep going. So, drag, follow through, slow in, slow out, this sort of S curve action, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in books, <coughs> all comes down to inertia. Again, this kind of diagram is what you see. You can see the sort of S curve action, something doing this. Um, it's exactly the same thing. Initiation point um, is moving this way, the rest is dragging behind. And the amount that it drags depends on what it's made of. We'll get back to that in a minute. If the point says stops dead, like that, this is going to keep going this way. If the point starts going the other way, this might keep going for a while, depending on how elastic it is. And then eventually, when everything's going this way, it'll catch up and change direction. It's because this has a certain amount of weight to it that it keeps going before it comes back. Now, the important thing to remember on an action like this is that every single minute, tiny point along this line has its own change of direction at a slightly different time. This means that if um, you've got a piece of animation, so this is moving this way, and then suddenly, you've got it like that, it starts moving back this way, like that. So just 
just in between that straight like that would be not that great. That would mean every single point changing direction at the same time. So even on the in between, on an action like this, it's better, you know, if um, we've got the indication of in that way. It's better to overlap it slightly. Sorry, that's a bit small. Um, it's better to overlap it slightly so that the top has gone a little further before it starts coming back again. So there are real no in between in this kind of action. And it happens in anything that is sort of loosely jointed, or like floppy on the wrist. Um, this looks to me like it might be kind of like a feather or something, the way the way that it's working, simply because <coughs> it looks kind of springy, this kind of action. I think if it were any looser, you know, it would tend to you know, flop down or what you would get is very much more exaggerated shape. over and then starts coming back that way. Now, this looks more like a whip or something like that, which is looser than a feather. If it were like a silk scarf or something like that, or maybe not silk, because that tends to get caught on the air. It makes things a bit more complicated. Um, yeah, if it was just like a piece of fabric or something, then it might even be even looser than that. Um, happens in our bodies as well, all over our bodies. The strange thing about our bodies is that they are variably flexible. They are loose sometimes, stiff at other times, depending on what you do with your muscles. Um, you can have a lot of sloppy reaction. If you relax your arm and just shake it like that, you can see that it's got a lot of this kind of thing in every joint. But I can stiffen it. That's good. So our bodies are feathers and they're also wood and all sorts of things. So you can make decisions in your animation uh, depending on if you want the character to have its muscles tense or not. Um, it's tempting sometimes <coughs> to always make everything very loose, but you can do that if it's fitting. You can also break that rule if you want a specific look, but you can have a character do all these joints things. Shoulder comes up, elbow comes up, wrist comes up, shoulder comes down, elbow comes down, wrist comes up, point. You do some really sort of floppy things. Or, um, Stromboli does this a lot, where he does gestures where he's not leading with the elbow, he's actually leads with the end of his finger, and he does a gesture like that, which is very Stiff because it has, it's not stiff in the animation, it's very fluid and well timed, but because he has the muscles in his arms and tense, his feet are like that, the point is that the way it loosens that up a lot is using the fabric in the sleeve you know, to give it some extra overlap, you know, to give it some dynamics, to make it not look like a piece of stiff animation. We also push it a long way, exaggerate that. But that's the strange thing about our bodies, is that they are, they can be different, they can be different things. Um, let's take a look at a clip. And uh, <coughs> I'll show you what I mean about <coughs> weight and balance, about stopping and starting and foot placement and how it works in reality. in general is very good to look at for analyzing human movement, um, mainly because it's sort of edited movement, it's because the, uh, the dancer has already wiped the slate clean, so to speak, of all those little jittery things that we all do, uh, and kind of boiled it down you know, to 
just the essence of the movement. It's a very controlled movement. Um, so it's kind of good to analyze because it's right there in front of you. It's easier to spot what's going on. <laughs> Underneath him, 
that means he's not going to stop at all. He's just going to bounce along. He's, uh, he wants to stop eventually. You can see that coming down here, he goes, boom, he has to take a little big step there in order to change direction. But the inside of the boat is not going to be So you can see that real Quite interesting because it shows a lot of foot preparation, which is important if you're doing an action where, especially if you're turning around, your feet tend to prepare ahead of you which direction you're going to be in. They sort of they point you in the direction that you want to go. About. So you can see that this foot here, instead of just Instead of just planting directly behind him in line with his body, it's twisted around, twisted around, so he can prepare that turn. That piece of sort of controlled follow through. On his arm, sort of exaggerated. That's using the muscles quite strongly in his arm to keep the muscles turn at the last minute. He relaxes just his wrist, basically, against that. Nice. It's almost like fake follow through, really, it's like control. Then he's going to do another jump. So leans forward, get the speed. Leans backwards to get the height. Swings up all the available wind. Get even more height. Then he comes down again at a slight angle. Counteract that forward. Sort of basics behind that particular piece of action. The basics, you know, which way is he leaning? Where's his foot going? And what does that do to his body? Um, you can stand back. Okay, tell me which button. Red, red button. button. cartoony, but sort of midway between the two worlds. It's not as wacky as you can get, but it's sort of a, a mid-ground piece of animation, as far as how to handle weight and balance. And she often wished that some champion would appear and for once take the field open against the boisterous bra. Thank you. 
overshoot on that hand there where it goes, where it goes out straight and comes back farther than it would and then springs back. It's sort of saying it's going so fast it has to go farther before it can start. So recoil. Reaching gesture. <coughs> Just watch his elbow. It comes up high. Flips forward. Like that. And then it straightens out. Even the flower.
great way of moving throughout this show when she doesn't go up and down. Ichabod goes up and down a Very, very exactly. She won't fly. <laughs> the sort of thought behind it, you know, is that he has to get his foot out there before his body gets there. You know, he can't just go body first and then feet. It's got to be the other way around. Even though it's ridiculous to look right, he still has to plant his foot out there first and have his body catch up if he's going to sit and stop. Around the screen, like detached little bit. 
Now here they've used speed lines, you can see the end of the tail. They also use little puffs of smoke, again, yeah, little cartoons that you mentioned that give, give, the, give the action some sort of follow through. So you know she's got that way, not that way. Set a gear. I don't know. 
don't know exactly what time, but next Friday we'll uh, get together again. <laughs> Thank you uh, for all showing up this time. Um, as for last night, uh, <laughs> I'm equally unprepared this week, so don't worry about it. Um, so last time we talked a little bit about basic mechanics, um, sort of skimmed the surface of a lot of it. Um, Today I'd like to talk about uh, planning and approach, uh, how to approach a scene from the beginning, and uh, personally, or how I personally approach it, and um, I'm trying not to, uh, all I can really do is tell you how I do it, lots of different animators do it in different ways, and um, from what I know, I'll, I'll see if I can tell you what they do as well, but uh, I'll just be able to tell you what I do. Um, if you talk to any of the old guys, any of like the... Uh, so-called veteran animators, um, they all stress planning you know, to a great degree. Um, they all sort of say, well, we were able to do eight, nine, ten feet away because we knew what we were doing. They would say that um, they had everything planned out in their heads or on paper before they even started animating. And it's very, very important to do that. Um, in some ways, you can wing it on the scene, but very, very rare, especially on production. You know, if you've got a specific task to meet, you've really got to have it planned out. Um, otherwise, you're just wasting time. Otherwise, you'll just end up animating the scene five times over you know, without really getting to the, to the, to the meat of it you know, sooner than you could. So planning and planning is very, very important. And for me, it's sort of um, a process when I approach a scene, it's sort of a process which goes more, it starts out emotional and gets more and more technical along the way. Um, so the very first pass that I do at a scene, it's like purely emotional. And uh, then once I get that nail, then I have to store it away in my head so I don't lose it during the technical phases. To try and get it on the screen, you know, with the emotional purity in it. Um, but with the sort of technical flair, which you know, make you forget that it's a bunch of drawing. Um, so planning. A lot of, I suppose the most common way <coughs> of planning the scene is using thumbnails. Um, most animators use thumbnails in some form or another. I tend to use them sort of in, they're pretty scribbly and almost in code. Really. You can't really tell what the drawings are very well in my thumbnails. Um, some animators do very, very elaborate thumbnails. You know, whether it's in every you know, part of the character, in every few frames, mm -hmm. Duncan, I know, uh, does, Duncan, my fan, does um, quite elaborate thumbnails usually. You know, will draw out the entire character, the expression, solve, try and solve all the problems you know, in, a, in a small size you know, before you even start the animation. Mm -hmm. Eric Goldberg, I think, doesn't hardly do any at all. He usually tends to do his planning large scale on animation paper. At animation side, um, I sort of do them as I as they come up. Really, I do more elaborate thumbnails as the tougher the problem is. If uh, I've got a specific staging or drawing problem, then I'm likely to do more thumbnails you know, to try and solve that you know, specific thing before I try and get into drawing the animation. If I've got a really clear idea of exactly what I want in my head then I won't bother doing it at all. It's just a question of, I'm pretty lazy really, so how much do I need to do to get by? <laughs> um, let's see, I've got the first clip here is a Frank Thomas scene from The Rescuers. It's not one of his best scenes, really, but I've got the thumbnails down there so you can see them. <coughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> come, come, come to think of it. If I was a pirate, I would I would not get anything back there. Fair enough. What? Like I say, it's like not. Better out 
not one of his best scenes ever. <laughs> Uh, come, come, come to think of it, but uh, I was a pirate. I would, I wouldn't hide anything back there. Very nice. Look. So it's an interesting thing because it's both walking and talking at the same time, which is usually pretty hard to do. To pull it off effectively, so the action and the dialogue fit together pretty well. Right. It's sort of a rambling theme. There's no real sort of strong poses, you know, one way or the other. He doesn't start somewhere, move somewhere, or stop. It's, it's just sort of a, kind of a, a general <laughs> rambling thing. But it still needs to communicate and be strong. <laughs> so as sort of loose and sort of straight ahead as it looks, there's still a lot of planning behind it to make it look this way. <laughs> Uh, come, come, come to think of it, but uh, I was a pirate. I would, I wouldn't hide anything back there. Very nice. Okay, so I'm glad. I hope this isn't too small. Might be a little small, but. Uh, now, I don't know if Frank really did these on the day, or whether he just kind of made this up for the illusion of life a bit later. <laughs> it's a bit neat for me. Um, and I hope you can all see this. But he's got little notes written under here, and he's pretty much just, just hit the major attitudes that he wants to get. Um, it says, draws hands up protectively. So he's just got this little thing. He's, all he's done really is enough drawing there to get the attitude, the main body attitude of trust. He's not too worried in this thing about you know, the facial expression, or at least he's not worried at the thumbnail stage about the facial expression. So it draws hands up protectively, so that's kind of one action, just this little backing up thing. Clears the throat, and he's got this little sketch, because he has an idea that he wants to do this stretched neck thing, and there with the bulging cheeks. <clears throat> then he starts to go into the walk and the talking at the same time. So he's got the words written down here, come to think of it, if I was a pirate, I would I would not. Um, so he says, lean out, pause, then gradually straighten up, slides foot back. So he's got this action where he's saying he wants to lean out, and then he wants to slide that foot back to get into the wall. Um, this comes back down to a little bit of action analysis again. He starts going into it very slowly, so he doesn't really need to lean that way, but he needs to plant that leg out behind him to get into this wall. Um, and he's just got some little steps going on here. And he writes, he puts an accent under the word I, because if you listen to the track, that's kind of the first major sort of dialogue accent. I don't think of it if I was a pirate, that's kind of I was a pirate. That's kind of the accent that brought here by hits in the voice track. So he's underlined it there, and he's got a definite head accent idea going on. This is the first time that he really turns his head back and up like that. So he knows he wants to hit this dialogue accents specifically. Um, then he just starts writing loose points, close eyes, start head shapes. So in this part of the scene it's basically almost a two-part action. It's, it's the head and the pointing and this gesturing sort of pasted on top of a body which is walking backwards. One is not totally independent of the other, but they're all, they almost are. You can't animate them completely independently because that's exactly the way they look if you can face them together. But the idea is that most of the acting is going on above the waist. So the first part of the scene is really more pose to pose. It's got more stronger just poses and in-betweens in it. Second half of the scene is a little bit more straight ahead, a little bit more flamboyant. Probably if he needs to do more drawings or more partial drawings, we'll get to that later, um, to make the scene work. 
So the first bit is just like really just three major keys. And then the second part, he's going to have to do a lot more of these drawings himself uh, during the second thing uh, to make this action work, so it's quite complicated. You'll notice too that he hasn't drawn a tail on any of these because really, unless you've got a specific graphic problem you need to solve, or there's a specific staging problem to do with drapery, um, there's really not much point in putting in a lot of follow through elements in your thumbnail because the loose objects like you know, flowing hair, and you can just sketch them in to make, to make the drawing make sense. Um, but there's not much point in trying to really figure out exactly what the tail is going to do on every single one of these thumbnails because it's something that's going to make itself apparent when you start animating. So it's just the bare bones of the action. Now we'll just have a quick look at that. Let's have a little look at the scene. And we'll see exactly what he did. Let's spot the keys. Come to think of it. There we go. Now he's kind of changed his uh, idea here. I don't know if he meant this in the thumbnails or not, but he's sort of changed his idea that he has the dialogue starting before he does that clearing throat thing. Maybe he sort of discovered that Bob Newhart did a, a little bit of a cough and thought he'd incorporate that. Or like I say, maybe the thumbnail's a bit But you can see the first part of the scene is a little bit more cozy. It just starts off here. Timed it so he was doing that head action, so his body was coming down, it just wouldn't be quite as strong. So this, this step here where he does that. And he does a little expansive hand gesture as well. Uh, I was a pirate, I would, I wouldn't, I, 
heading you back there. Better not! Right? Now, it looks to me like you've done about every other drawing on this walk here. This is a fairly complicated action. The animator would need to do most of the drawings himself. You might be able to have a few of the bodies filled in by interesting the things that you look these hand gestures where it's just these rotating hands. There is, Captain, you need it. John, all right. Get anything back there. This sort of rotating hand thing where he's just kind of doing this is a sort of almost a straight ahead type of an action. Um, so probably what the animator did was to get this body and head thing working, you know, in a rough sort of stage, and then go back through the scene and start adding the little details like, like this, exactly what he wanted these hands to do. And then maybe go back through the scene again, add the tail to make sure it was sort of bouncing along nicely. Um, so essentially it's, it's sort of a layering process. Um, Well, this is mine, so I can tell you exactly what I'm thinking. I'm not showing you this just because I think it's good on it. <laughs> but because I did this, I can tell you exactly what I was doing. <laughs> Part of planning is that every now and then, not often, but every now and then you're going to get scenes which come together in continuity and it's a lot more fun. Um, and that way you can start playing around with the cut and the hookups as well. Which, uh, some people seem to find terribly difficult and I don't know why. Um, because to me they seem very, very logical how to hook one scene into the next. <laughs> This is a difficult scene uh, to plan out because he has to do this sort of flamboyant or semi-flamboyant sort of action with this turtle shell, which unfortunately has to be animated by hand, so it has to look solid. Um, but the trick to something like this is how do you make that look solid um, and yet keep the sort of flamboyance and, and the idea that he's doing it to the shell and the shell isn't doing it to him. Um, having worked a lot with like computer um, elements, trying to match up to computer elements with hand-drawn animation, um, the way I did this was I sketched out the whole thing in rough, just sort of basic poses. Then I went and had a really good idea of what this rotation type of action was going to be. Um, and then I went in and animated the shell, just the shell, just floating around doing this little action. And then I put Rafiki, added Rafiki to that. Because if I had just done Rafiki first, I think I've got it in rough. If I had just done Rafiki first, um, I might have got his hands in the wrong place. I have no idea where this tape is, so excuse me. It's in the wrong place. This is like my rug. Okay, so this would be like my first pass at it, which, 
it's good enough or if it's readable enough, I'll show it to a director. <laughs> Different music. <laughs> I think it's from far and away. <laughs> So it's kind of a little bit of a different action. I think it's a little bit broader than, than what ends up in the final film. I showed this to Roger Allison. He said it looks too much like tossing salad and, and not enough like panning for gold. So I had to kind of tone it down a bit. But this would be sort of the stage that the drawings would be in on my first pass. And really, there's not much attention to technical spacing on the body or anything like that. It's really just purely attitude drawings and staging drawings and just sort of basic timing thing. I only do as many drawings as I can get away with to sell the action. So it's really just keys and that breakdown. There's a little bit of sort of planning going on in my head as what I'm actually going to do when I get to tight down. As you can see, it's really just that pose going into that pose. And how you get from one to the other. So there's just a few breakdowns in there to show that I want to turn his head first you know, while he's anticipating that thing. And then bend his body the other way and swipe it. The leaves into the shell, like that. And then there'll just be like one breakdown, and like, oh, there wasn't, wasn't any. Forget it. <laughs> just go straight from there to there. So you can see a lot of these drawings get pretty minimal as far as all I try and do is indicate with the head angle, the eye line and uh, where the features are, what kind of angle his head is at, and just a, a basic idea of the expression. But that's it. That was reduced from sequence one. And that's the same kind of idea. And with the floating shell, so I started tying down the first bit because the shell wasn't moving yet, it's just a health cell. Now, the way I usually do stuff is after I've um, gone through with my rough pass, I then try and think on a more technical level. Keeping the emotional acting in mind, I try and think, how am I going to break this scene down into movement? And what, is, what does that movement mean? How am I going to break this scene down into charts and in-betweens, really? Because I don't want to do all the work. I want to try and you know, be as economical as possible. And in a good way, that usually means that you can be as clear as possible because using in-betweens a lot of the time adds control to the work. If you've got too many keys in rough space too close together, you'll know that in cleanup that can get slightly misinterpreted if you're, if you're working very rough and you can get your big spacing problems going on. So what I find the best way to work is a combination really between pose to pose, and straight ahead. So I'll have the same, both disciplines going on in, in the same scene at the same time. So I might have his body as two keys and a bunch of in-betweens, but if I want some flamboyant gesture with his hands, I will do every single drawing to get exactly what I want. So you can see this is my keys um, without the rough in-betweens. What I usually do is I do all my stuff in graphite and I get a rough in-between to fill in the rest in some colored pencil. Just so clean up down the road can tell who did what. So that I can say to them, the graphite stuff is for real. That's the stuff that you follow. The rough in-between stuff is just for the rough test. Don't worry about it too much. So you can see that the body is on a, you know, on a health cell here. And then I just did like a tiny indication of that rough in between there. Then that's my next key. But his body is in red, so 
that'd be the rough in between of putting that in. So the body is on the chart still. And so that one, which is the next major key, is totally in graphite there. So it's really that one, that one, that one. But because the spacing of the scene is really just start slow, speeds up, slows down again, I didn't want that to happen with the hand, really. I wanted this very specific arc over and down. It wasn't. It doesn't just lift his hand up on a bunch of in-betweens like that. It goes up and down, so it overshoots it. While the rest of his body is just doing the mechanical thing, he's got a slightly more flamboyant action going on with his hand. Which I would draw myself. But it takes all that sort of pre-planning, and it definitely takes doing that scribble test beforehand to know what you're doing, where you're going. And then this is the shell that's kind of floating there. Now don't get me wrong, I didn't just animate this without knowing what he was going to do. I knew exactly that he was going to go over there and drag the shell with him and then come back and drag it that way. So I posed it out before him. I knew what was going on. It was just a technical way of getting the shell looking solid and his hands registering it to properly. body starts slowing into the top, but I wanted a very specific set of drawings for that hand coming up. Uh, and the only way you can do this is if you know what your charts are going to be. There's no point just drawing a hand floating in space, connecting up to some shoulder where you, you don't know what the chart is. You have to know what the body chart is in order to put this, that shoulder right there in the right place. So, anyway, that's up just a little bit. So you can see how it gets emotional and then more and more technical as it goes along. sequence up here which I'll sort of go through briefly just to tell you some of the thoughts that were that were behind it. What was that? <laughs> the weather. Yeah. Very peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it for so long. Stop. 
Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? First, I'm going to take your stick. No, no, no! Let us keep... Hey! Where are you going? I'm going by! So, for most of the sequence, when you see Simba and Rafiki together, I did both characters. When you just see Simba, it's Randy Haycock, and um, when you just see Rafiki, it's me. The weird part about that is um, two animators going one shot, back and forward, back and forward, always constantly trying to hook up to each other. Now, the thing about hookups is that you not only have to match the pose you know, of the previous scene, um, of course, if the camera's from a different angle, you know, you have to <coughs> obviously take that into account, but you also have to match the spacing going through it. It's no good if the character's moving really fast at the end of one scene, and all of a sudden he's a dead stop, even if he's in the same pose at the beginning of yours. So you have to not only get the last drawing, but really the last two keys, you know, from the other animator. Figure out the spacing of it to make it look really good. <coughs> so this is my Simba. Rather yeah. fairly peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have. And that's Randy right there. <laughs> so, I not only have to start getting into his theme, and that's really my last key on Simba, but the end of the scene is just to get into his theme. So, it's not just the uh, expression in the drawing, how fast his head is moving across there, which makes it a decent poker. I know what I have to do, but going back means I'll have to face my past. I've been running from it. That's easy because he's still. No, no trouble there. Ow! Jeez, what was that for? It doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> The other thing about doing a sequence like this is planning it so that you're leading the eye around the screen, telling people where you want to look. In other words, it's, it's all to do with not moving things. Um, good idea. It's really pretty obvious, but the character that's talking is going to be doing the moving. The one you want listening, just don't have him do anything. Was that? <laughs> the weather. Yeah. Okay. Little reactions. Peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. So, the minute that he stops speaking, Rafiki just goes into a hold there and just starts blinking. It's a good way to disguise the hold. Like <laughs> don't you think? Yeah. <coughs> Don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Oh. Yes, Yeah. Very peculiar. Don't you think? Yeah. 
Oh, Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, uh, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have. <laughs> 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 really, that's a good. It's a good way to get in and out of folds. If you if you have some, it doesn't have to be the eyes. It can be a tail. It can be you know if you've got a character that flicks its ears. It can be just one part of the body which is moving. It can be on a health, and the rest can be on a health side. Because no matter how many in betweens you've got, if you, if you do this big long chart of the in betweens, no matter how fine they get, if it's close enough on the screen. You will always see it go thick. Like that. You will always see it just stick. If there's any way at all that you can get different parts of the body going into the hold at different times and, and coming out of it as well, um, it looks so much better. You can have a period of trace back on the body while the head or the hair is set <coughs> in. It's so much easier, or a period where part of it is actually on a held cell, you know, and the eyes are blinking or something. Um, Getting in and out of holes. So, this is the sort of bit where I would do every drawing on this face and say, this weird sort of. body going into the hold at different times and, and coming out of it as well, um, it looks so much better. You can have a period of trace back on the body while the head or the hair is set <coughs> in. It's so much easier, or a period where part of it is actually on a held cell, you know, and the eyes are blinking or something. Um, getting in and out of holes. <coughs> So, this is the sort of bit where I would do every drawing on this face and say, in this weird sort of. <laughs> Very peculiar, don't you think? Yeah. Looks like the winds are changing. Ah, change is good. Yeah, but it's not easy. I know what I have to do, but... And then, the thing again is just not moving very much while Cinder's doing his little... I've been running from it for so long. <laughs> and then... I might have a few in-betweens going on on his body, but really... Unfortunately, it's a question of doing pretty much everything he's playing on. On something like this. I mean, I might have put that one on a chart. Something that's really crazy. Just a little four frame startle before it gets goes, Ow! Reach! Okay. His head. It doesn't look as violent as it is in slow motion. His head only comes down a little bit. And you get that big squash in the middle, so you don't see it that well. It's the effect that you get is Simba's head just kind of goes back. He has that wide eye thing for four frames. <laughs> so, a lot of this stuff on his body will be on a chart, you know, and then things like his hands, his dialogue, but 
to this day, you know, I would have, you know, I'd be drawing. So you need to know what the chart is, otherwise it won't be in the next class. It won't get filled in. Well, it doesn't matter. It's in the past. <laughs> yeah, but it still hurts. Oh, yes, the past can hurt. But the way I see it, you can either run from it or learn from it. Ah, you see? So what are you going to do? So it's got it's got poses in it. It's got like one, two. It's just finding interesting ways to get from one to the other, or to work through them so you don't see them. That's why I often like to have some part of the body which does not obey the chart at all, or the main body chart. But which goes through the action. So if I've got the body just slowing in, and I, and I have a hand here or something that I want to disguise where that key is, I might just have the hand do its own little thing, you know, while the body slows in and slows out. You can still use in between us to do it, but it's a good way to. So you don't have the entire body going, and you get this sort of animation which sort of morphs between keys, all at the same rate. And you can really watch it go, yes, yes. Okay. Ah! You see? So what are you going to do? Yes. I had fun with this pointing thing. I didn't just want to do this straight arc down, arc back. I did this. I had fun trying to do this sort of figure eight. That. The uh, part of the finger comes down, and under, and up, and over. So what are you going to do first? So this is the only thing where I think we actually shared the screen together, but that's not my that's Wendy sent up to my people. So this is even harder to really make work together because you have to really swap drawings around a lot and say, when are you doing this? Better take your stick. No, 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 let us keep it! Hey! Let me cover it all up with long grass. Mm -hmm. I got this reaction in the wrong place. I didn't get it like too soon or too late. Very precise. I try and draw, you know, quite cleanly usually. Um, there's still an attempt to keep it loose in the shapes. You know, pay attention to all that drag and follow through with weight and squash and stretch. So it was all part of that mechanics stuff. So to keep it all in mind, even when you're being tight and controlled, to keep it that looseness, that flexibility. But there's still a sense that his face sort of bend slightly as it drags, his hair gets left behind. His face stretches on the way up, his hair drags behind it, and it pops up. His head stops. He gets his bullet head on the way up, and then he fluffs up on the way down. And a lot of that mechanic stuff, having the head do a little bit of a Take your stick. No, 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 
just keep... Hey! Where are you going? I'm going back. What? Get out of here! So, starting off emotional, getting more and more and more technical, keeping all the emotional stuff in mind when you're being technical, so you don't lose it, which is very easy to do. Um, some of the little things that I do often, what do I do? Um, when I start getting technical and boiling it down, I start looking at little parts of the drawing to make sure that they're working properly. When I'm flipping, I start pick his shoulder. Okay, what's that doing? Is that going to start going jiggling around like I don't want it to? Is it going to be working properly? Is it slowing in or slowing out the way I want it to? Um, so I'll just go through and check all these little things and make sure that you we've know, got a pencil that's following from the arc. Um, a thing that I mentioned earlier is trying to get the feeling that you're moving through these keys and you're not just going straight from one to the other, all parts of the body. Often if I have a very long slow-in that I want to do, um, and I don't just want to have just one key here, like three feet later, <laughs> like one key here, and expect you know, all the in-betweeners to get it exactly right. If I want something, if I want the dialogue going on, if I have a body action which is just moving from here, that I want to go, well, I don't know, in the middle of it. I might actually want, want to make that, well, a key. I might feel like doing it, even though it would be just as easy for the in between to make the body. Um, so in a sense, I've got a key body in there, but it's kind of not really necessary. It could just as well be in between, even though the head is doing something which has to be key. So, in that sense, I'll make the, the drawing an entire key, but I'll, I'll pay ultra-critical attention to where I'm placing that body, you know, in regard to the charts that are around it. Because if I've got, like, a big old slowing <coughs> going on, let's say, in the chart between D1 and D2 and D3, Say this chart is just even, like that. Even progression all the way through. And then say the chart between these two is like a slow. Um, something you see a lot in uh, animation, uh, it's all in between screens, or what I call popping stalling, which is this effect right here. The effect that you're after, you know, with these three, this key is here purely because I wanted some strange action to go on, like a head action, just to make it easier to clean up. Um, the entire action is just to and then slide down. If these keys were spaced like this, you get a pop in there, you get this uncomfortable little Pop before it's Similarly, if this is too close, you know, or you know, you've got the key there, you know, like that, you've got like two drawings in here, and you've got this one, or you like and this, and you pack it all over straight drawing, you're suddenly going to get this uh, stall. Stalls. Yeah, so it's like a pop and it's a stall. Um, so what I try and do is pay critical attention to the transition over that key, so that if I've got this spacing happening, and I want this to be just that slow in, I want you to not be able to feel that transition across that key drawing right there, or it goes the spacing to work logically as one, and then mm, that's the sort of thing I do you know, when I'm trying to 
go through a highly technical level, right at the very end of the scene, where we actually worked out everything. Um, and just tying down that these little things, you know, which make you, you know, which makes the work sort of sing and not the you know, sort of distracting sort of wobbly stuff that is going on, and distracting from the actors. Um, I guess next week uh, we'll go on and talk more in detail about acting. Um, I've got ten more minutes. I could just start. It's almost to do with planning anyway. I'm going to talk a little bit about acting out uh, your own scenes and uh, how to translate that onto the paper. Um, a lot of animators, and essentially we're all doing a lot of human characters these days. So I think most of us are human. Right? So it's pretty easy to um, obviously act out your own scene very much to a certain extent. Um, the trick to acting stuff out is um, getting all uh, freed up and emotional about it. You know, so you get your sort of gut reactions, your gut feelings, your, you know, your, your most emotional performance out, you know, stiffing up and just like, oh, I'm going to do something. Um, but also, in the back of your head, trying to remember what you're doing while you're doing it. So it's a little bit of a trick um, in that you've almost got to switch a little kind of recorder on in the back of your mind with a sort of a motion capture device, which you wear you know, in the back of your head to think, what am I actually doing with my body when I am doing this acting? You know, if I'm trying to act out a piece you know, of dialogue, you know, I want to do a specific head shake or something. You know, what, what was that all about? What did I actually do right then? Exactly what did I do? Because if it's going to end up on the paper, it has to be exactly what you did. Um, it's a different effect if I had moved a couple of feet forward while I was doing that, you know, in the same amount of time. It's a completely different effect. It's a different effect if that head shake is slow, you know, compared to being fast. So, in a sense, there's a part of me which wants to, you know, loosen up and be free about it. Another part of me which says, okay, my head only really moved a few inches about over here or less. How's my head moved? How did that? Down How much was that head shake? Was it you know, from here to here, or was it just from there to there? What exactly am I doing uh, doing this thing? Um, and the same applies you know, with your body, too. You're acting something out physically. <coughs> you to videotape it, if, you, if you're in any doubt. If you feel that the performance is uh, one that you want to be that realistic, that you can really use video reference and it's going to be valuable to you uh, in film yourself. Um, so, what am I doing while I'm doing it? That, that's really the trick that I find. Um, I don't use a mirror very much. Um, a lot of animators find it very useful. I think I sometimes use it if I have a, a weird drawing problem on an on a angle of my body that I can't see. Um, but uh, a lot of the time I find uh, Mirrors just tend to you know, put my particular mouth shapes onto a character instead of you know, the character's own you know, mouth shape. Um, but you know, if you find them useful, you know, go ahead. You might have. Um, so really, that's that's kind of the basic idea as far as acting out um, for me goes. And then to try and get it down on paper, you know, as quickly as I can before I forget what I did, either with sketches, with notes. Anything I can do you know, that helps me remember that spontaneity of performance that you want to get. Because you want to try and make the performance look spontaneous you know, and not planned out. The strange thing about animation is that it's probably the most unspontaneous type of acting you can do. You know, it's really a few seconds dragged out into weeks of planning. Um, so you, you've really got to try and struggle to maintain the spontaneity of your initial gut feeling you know, in the final version. Um, so it's sort of a left brain, right brain combination. Both of both sides switched on at the same time. You know, what, what am I doing emotionally? What am I doing physically, technically, mathematically? Um, next week, we'll talk more about acting, I guess. Uh, and we'll do some more videos. So, I hope to see you there.
Picking up where we left off, we were talking about acting. Uh, at the end of last week, I was talking about acting out your scenes and how to uh, mentally record what you're doing while you're doing it. Yeah. This is the result on the screen. Today, I'm going to go on uh, a bit more talk about acting and dialogue. Because we have to come up now, talking about acting and dialogue, getting lip sync. Um, so acting, um, most act, most of the acting is done really with the body. I mean, that's where it's like the majority of the attitude comes from is in the body. Uh, it's a mistake to get too bogged down in facial expressions, funky mouth shapes, and all that sort of stuff until you've really figured out the basic attitudes. That's where it really all comes from. Um, I'm always amazed at how good. Some of the acting is on some of the Muppets, where they have no change of expression and only an open and closed mouth. So there's really nothing going on in here except this and this. So it's all done with attitude and the body posture. And the acting moves very well. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have seen the books and pictures of flower sacks drawn and they have certain attitudes. But it's really very, very important. Um, so that should come really in the planning stages, in your thumbnails, getting the attitudes sorted out pretty quickly. It's always amazing for me to watch um, cartoons that have no dialogue, like some of the Chuck Jones ones, the Bulldog cartoon. Those to me are like right up there as far as the best you can do, as far as just pure attitude drawing. It conveys the most amount of information and attitude and emotion, and there's no dialogue at all. It's all done with very limited sound effects, but the attitudes are so clear that the drawings are not there. I should have brought some more. I have a Maybe I'll have to bring one and set next time. So, really, body attitude is really your starting point. Uh, and then you can go back in and start. And screwing them out with uh, facial expressions and mouth shapes and specifics uh, along those lines. Um, live action is uh, excellent to watch, I find, uh, for acting because it gives you things you wouldn't expect. I'm, I'm always trying to come up with uh, acting patterns which I feel I haven't seen before or I haven't seen animated before. Um, it's very easy to slip back into a lot of the same old head patterns, head accents, hand gestures, um, build into stable hand gestures and stuff, and end up using the same ones over and over again. So I like to try and look at live action to see you know, subtle little head shapes, strange sort of head movements and figure eight patterns, and things that people do with their heads and their hands and their whole bodies while they're acting. So live action, is, I find it's very good to look for that, and to try and translate that into animation that you've never seen before. Um, let's take a look at a clip. Um, it's a very animated live action. This guy moves a lot. <laughs> About a year ago, I was going to night school. I was taking this course in advanced accounting. One of the guys in our department, Sister Jersey, he had to go to a banquet at the building where his wife was being in the town. He needed some place to change into a tuxedo, so I gave him the key. And word must have gotten out, because the next thing I knew, all sorts of guys are suddenly going to banquets. Well, you get a key away, guy, you can't say no to one other. The whole thing got out of hand. And, pardon me. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> His name is Baxter, by the way. So just going through this on sort of surfacey level, just looking at how much stuff is going on, it's great just to break through and just looking at the angle of his head. That's 
kind of inhale there. Inhale is my final as hell. Make your character come alive, inhaling and exhaling. Just watch his body just rise and change shape. And you can see his neck and his tie sink down as he exhales into that first word. So there's sort of basic poses going on. Actually, I don't know. It's sort of like, out of your eyes, go out and go to night school. And then he looks up and is taking this course. But he doesn't just go from there to there. He overshoots it a little bit. It's a little figure eight pattern at the end. This is where we come to hand gestures now. So this is like head nods, but they're more than just nods, they're sort of total sort of body rocking thing. Pointing hand gestures, it's almost like his head is a bouncing ball. Change into a tuxedo, so I hid the key. And word must have gotten out. You can see how much he moves his head. About timing, um, we'll get onto lip sync in a minute, but I wanted to say a word about timing of hand gestures uh, and so on. It's always good to time accents with the body and with the head, and with the hands, um, a few frames earlier than the sound. Say he's um, saying you wanted to do that on the word banquet. Yeah. It's always good to have that come down maybe four to two frames before that big A on the X sheet. Um, this is not to say the actual the mouth has to do this, we'll get into that in a minute. But as far as actual hand gestures, points, slaps, things that have an accent to them, it's good to time them before the actual sound if you're trying to make it look like your accent. Um, and that's going to come all back into your sort of planning stages as to, okay, which drawing do I really want as my extreme, which drawing do I really need as a key here. Um, sometimes it's easy to go in and do a nice big key with a point and a big open mouth that says, ah, for banquet. You know? But really, you might want to think about it a little harder and say, maybe my extreme for the point is going to be like two frames before that. Maybe I should have that closed mouth. The but of banquet before so we have that be the extreme, and then go through and put mouth shapes on at the end. I always find it better to get the timing of the body and the head down without mouth shapes really before I start doing the, putting them on 
later. And then I usually go through and try and make sure that they're working as a drawing. You, know, you might have a really great idea for a sort of drawing of a mouth on it. Um, it's always good to go through it again on a sort of drawing pad just to try and make all these things connect up and, and look cool and graphic. However, however graphic you want to be with it. So, um, <coughs> timing of hand gestures. Let's talk a little bit about lip sync um, and how to get good sync for a start. A lot of people say, oh, just take the X sheet and do it one frame before and everything will be perfect. Some people say, no, do it right on the money and it'll be fine. They just don't do everything two frames before. Um, what I found from talking to um, a lot of different animators and also to track readers is it's sort of a combination to do with how tracks are read and what they put down when they hear certain sounds, and um, which sort of gives the illusion of shifting things back sometimes as far as the map shapes go. You take the word, this is an X sheet. And you've got the word power. your track reader has done that for you, and it comes from silence, so there's nothing happening before this. Um, for the people that think it's correct to do it right on the money, it's a mistake to have that P as a closed mouth and that one as an open mouth, because when a track reader is reading this sound, an explosive sound, what he does is, very often, you have to usually have to check with your track reader to see how he works. But very often, if it's an explosive sound which comes from silence, like power, I can't say the word power until my lips part. So when the track reader first hears that sound there, he puts the P and on the very next frame he puts the O. Now, the actual sound of that P, the actual sound that he's hearing, is the lips parting right there. So, on the explosive sound, you often find on explosive sounds, track reader will, will put one letter, and then on the very next frame, you'll put the next letter. So, you should actually pop your mouth open on that word right there. And it should be a closed mouth leading up to it. That's an explosive sound. If the word was mouse, where you can hear, I can say mouse. I don't have to be silent before it. So the track reader can actually tell the difference between the M mm and the O. Then you're more likely to be able to get away with having you know, the, the track reader has put M up here and then mouse. Okay, so you've got your M and then your O. You can do that right on the money and it'll be fine. Because the track reader can actually tell when that sound is coming. It's not coming from dead silence. Um, another thing that sort of gives validity to the theory of putting everything before the sound is that you need to do uh, preparation and recall. Uh, it's no good coming from a closed mouth straight into a word like get out. Um, your mouth prepares the G sound a good you know, four or six frames before you actually hear or obviously see any sound on the X sheet. If you have the words, you know. A good example of this in Terminator 2. The only words that the liquid guy says as a computer generated character is get out. So it looks kind of weird um, because he goes, they scanned all the actors' mouth shapes, were, you know, they were very careful about the mouth shapes that they chose. What they didn't do was prepare for it and, and recoil from it. So if you 
watch the film and sort of go net out like that. He swallows the beginning of the sound because he starts with a closed mouth and goes straight into the get out. It's quite an interesting phrase for, for dialogue. It has a lot of weird stuff in it. You need to prepare this G sound. If you've got a closed mouth expression, you want to take it out. You've got to open up the mouth. There'll, there'll often be an inhale to help you do that anyway. But you're going to need to open his mouth you know, about here two or three frames before, at the very least, to get that, to start forming that get, get out, G mouth shape. Um, similarly, at the end of this phrase, out, even though there's no sound written on the X sheet, you can't just close the character's mouth when there's silence directly after it. It's get out, more little so you can't really close the mouth unless you want to. You don't have to take it at all. But if the scene requires it, uh, you should, shouldn't do it until like a couple of frames after uh, that teaser. So this is what you see on your X sheet. What's actually happening with the mouth to get these sounds? The G is is the tongue separating from the roof of the mouth. Right there. So, you've got your G mouth shape, you've got your, you can open his, his mouth like here, on this page. Yeah, you say that sound comes when the tongue separates from the roof of the mouth. Get. Similarly, T is, is also the tongue coming off the, the roof of the mouth. So, on a T, you might have the tongue up at the top of the mouth here, and then it comes off the roof of the mouth there. Like that. And the same on this one, too. You've got out, like that. That T is you. It's not, so you wouldn't have a big mouth going to an O, and then just T, like that. Um, this is the tongue separating from the mouth. So you're going to want to see the tongue at the top of the, the mouth in the frame before, and then it comes down there. This is sort of a realistic lip sync, I suppose you would call it. This is what actually happens to real people's mouths when they say these words on these frames. Um, there's a lot of other things which go on if you're going to do. Um, or caricatures, more cartoony dialogue. And depending on what the character design is, also it uh, influences what kind of lip sync and dialogue you're going to do. Um, if the style of the picture is very realistic, you know, you're going to have to have your teeth set into the skull, you know, and no matter what you do with your mouth, you know, the, the, the top set of teeth always have to stay the same distance you know, from the bridge of the nose. It's a tack, it doesn't move. So you're going to have to animate in that sort of style. And I imagine uh, physically difficult to follow that kind of thinking. Um, the more cartoonier you get, the more you can start breaking those sort of solid rules, do more cartoony things, have a, a mouth that's completely full of teeth, uh, and then have a mouth which has like no teeth in it at all, even though you know, it's in the same point on the kind of the skull. Uh, teeth that uh, appear to uh, come and go, as it were, depending on if you need them or if you don't. The thing you have to watch, I think, in that kind of dialogue is that you don't want teeth sort of apparently in between and up and down, that you can actually see them sort of lowering and leaving. For me, it's a little bit distracting. So you have to uh, find clever ways uh, to pop them on and off and uh, avoid that problem. And then, depending on what sort of character design you've got, you can do dialogue without teeth. There's lots of characters that don't have teeth. Um, we'll see one in just a second. Um, 
So in that scenario, you'll be relying a lot more on the mouth shapes uh, to sell exactly what word has been said. Um, and you can also, uh, in an extreme sense, do uh, dialogue without uh, tongue as well. And do without But um, in that case, you really have to be very clever as far as uh, exactly how you control those mouth shapes. It's just a little more graphic or a little more simplified. But you can do it. So, let's say one more thing about closed mouths. The other thing I find about dialogue is that closed mouths are notoriously hard to see. If you've got squeeze two frames out of it somehow. If you just put a close mouth on for one frame, it's notoriously hard to see. Um, I've never seen a mouth shape uh, a closed mouth that's been put on for one frame that really, really works. So usually the trick to this is making sure that you've got a closed mouth on that one and also on that one too. So that even if uh, the character's talking really, really, really fast, they have an apparently open mouth there. Like it's good to try and close it for those two frames, just so you catch that close mouth. Uh, they're usually pretty important to, to make sure the dialogue look real. So B's, P's, M's, um, only at least two frames, and really as many as you can squeeze out of them is best. Let's have a look at a whole. Um, sequence and uh, sort of take it apart in terms of staging, acting, head patterns, dialogue, the rest of it. <coughs> yeah, it should be. You are high in truth. I'll be right down. Yes, yes. Who is it? It's me, Shere Khan. Uh, I'd like a word with you, if you don't mind. Shere Khan? What a surprise. Yes, isn't it? I just dropped by. Uh, forgive me if I've interrupted anything. Oh, no, nothing at all. I thought perhaps you were entertaining someone up there in your coils. Coils? Someone? Oh, I know. I was just curling up for my siesta. But you were singing to someone. Who is it, Carl? Oh, 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 no, oh, I was just singing uh, to myself. Indeed. Yes. yes, you see, I have trouble with my sinuses. What a pity. Oh, you have no idea. It's simply terrible. I can't eat. I can't sleep. So I sing myself to sleep. You know, self-hypnosis. Let me show you how it works. A trust in me. <laughs> I, I can't be bothered with that. I have no time for that sort of nonsense. Some other time, perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> but at the moment I'm searching for a man cub. Man cub? What man cub? The one who's lost. Now, where do you suppose he could be? Search me. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't mind showing me your coils, would you, Carl? Uh, certainly not. Oh. Nothing here? And nothing in here. Mm. <laughs> My sinuses. Mm. 
indeed. And now, how about the middle? The middle? Oh, the middle. Absolutely nothing in the middle. <clears throat> really? Well, if you do just happen to see the man cub, you will inform me first. Understand? Oh, I get the point. Cross my heart, hope to die. Good show. <laughs> and I must continue my search for the helpless little. <laughs> So, pretty long sequence. Um, these two characters talking to each other, pretty simple staging. Um, and technically, works very well. A couple of things I'm not quite too sure about. Every now and then, I see something that's. I think, gosh, does that really work? On the whole, it does. Very well. Okay. Uh, maybe next week or the week after I'll do a bit on animal walks. So we can uh, maybe look at this again. Your eyes. <laughs> Interesting thing about something like this is that something you don't see as much now as you used to is animating in the middle of the paper with the feet sliding on the bottom, animating in place and not across the layout. Which is what makes it seem like this so successful because you can be really, really consistent from the volume to the head and uh, the ups and downs of the body. In other words, the camera is not tra trying to track some animation across a piece of paper and basically cancelling out your, your move that you've done. Um, which inevitably ends up as being very inconsistent and jiggly because you can't be that consistent if you're animating across the page like that. So part of what makes this scene technically better is that um, as long as you can get the foot sliding at the right speed, um, it's good to sometimes do a scene like this. Like your eyes screen while that, while that happens. It's good to sort of be in one area of the screen and so the audience really picks up on it. It's being as obvious as hell <coughs> what you want to be. <coughs> so just starting with the take, um, you can see from a technical standpoint, he uses the sort of follow through action of the head. The head is all of these things, so the back goes down first. The nose drags behind it like that. There's a squat on the eyes. And guess what? It goes into a hole and blinks. <laughs> and then, and then you see this compression of the, the features just into this. Ooh. By the way, this character has no teeth and no tongue. 
They have a tongue, but it's not really used for bad. Mm. Mm. Did you see that? <laughs> Did you see it happen? Mm. Then you've got the mouth wide. Another thing about dialogue throughout this sequence is that mouth shapes are not just standard mouth shapes. They're not just big rows of teeth for T, and they're not just um, sort of big wide mouths for E. The mouth shapes conform to the expression of the character. In other words, if you've got, he's going, ooh, and he wants to say now what. A lot of, when he says now what, the T of what is not like that, like you might find in a sort of Saturday morning cartoon. Um, the T of what is what. You still got this expression on his face. And the head action is just basically uh, to the north, downward motions. <laughs> Then you see the other expression come over his face where he's still pretty still. What? I'll be right down. And then there's a nice little sort of happy head shape. Um, so you see the angle of his head, in other words, his eye line is like this, and also his head is shaking at the same time, so it's more. And it's done almost as, a, as an anticipation to this drop that he's going to do. So it's the sort of thing where the animator would do either every drawing or every other drawing, or at least on the head. Probably the body would be filled in um, on a chart, but that's quite a complicated little action. A lot of drawing doesn't really need leads with the top of the head there. Coming down. I'll be right down. Yes, yes. Who is it? It's me, Sharon. It's me, Shere Khan. Uh, I'd like a word with you, if you don't yeah. mind. Shere Khan? Yeah. What a surprise. Yeah. So, right. All he's got going is this little tail thing, and uh, he blinks to keep it live. <laughs> as far as the pattern of the acting goes, while he's doing this sitting down thing, right. he's got the first phrase, which is Shere Khan. Sure, calm. And then I'd like to work with you if you don't mind. Um, so the first word is really a slow in to his basic pose, his first pose. So it's slow in on sheer calm. And then he starts speaking again and I'd like to work with you if you don't mind. And he wants to really be settled into this lying down position by the word mind. So he's kind of got it planned out that he will do most of the sitting down action in the next phrase, and his head will be coming up on the last word, which is mine. Uh, I'd like a word with you, if you don't mind. And the only way to animate a tiger as well as this is to know the bird. Uh, like I say, we'll, we'll, we'll do some animal work in a couple of weeks, if you want. 
But look at the preparation he's got going with his mouth shapes. No sound, no sound. The sound doesn't start until his mouth is really wide. He doesn't pop it open like that. It's idle like a word. So he's still got this sort of slight drag going on. Good girl. Uh, I'd like a word with you, if you don't mind. Shere Khan, what a surprise. So this is a, you, you see a lot of the same head patterns occurring again and again in this sequence. And maybe it's getting a little bit more. But this one is, on the car is one more. What a surprise. What a surprise. Again, two frames on that key of surprise. You can see it. One, two. The other thing you'll see all throughout this sequence is uh, the, the graphics or the tendency to um, pop your vowel sounds open and then uh, recoil. So you've got your, your closed mouth. So really with the chin, the sort of phrasing of the dialogue is like bounces, like bounces like this. So. A lot of the closed mouths will pop to a fairly large mouth, then they'll start recoiling. Or they might just pop to a fairly large mouth, and then get ever so slightly larger, and then start coming back. Uh, the point is that rarely, unless the um, dialogue really specifically calls for it, unless it really is a sound which is getting progressively louder, like you're going, if you say a word like that, then your mouth is going to get slowly larger. Usually the tendency in animation is to pop those vowel sounds open fairly wide, fairly soon, or then spend time recoil. But if you watch the pattern, a lot of it is sort of spent in this sort of bouncing ball type, type action. Um, the other thing you'll notice here is that not, obviously not every vowel has the same emphasis. So as far as the chin goes, um, you see that a lot of the sounds are very, very reduced and only the really big accents get a good wide mouth. And some of them are even miss out altogether, which sometimes I find doesn't quite work. Every now and then there's one where I think, gosh, it didn't really actually look like he said that at all. What a surprise. Yes, isn't it? Good example, isn't it? Surprise. Yes, isn't it? It doesn't really say it at the end of the wall. You've got yes. That's the it of isn't it, but it doesn't do the it at all. You might have been tempted to Space is a sign. If I wasn't going to do anything with the jaw, I would at least have done something obvious with the tongue. You could actually see the tongue going on. Up and down inside there to get that hidden bit. Yes, isn't it? Explosions to say. Yes, isn't it? I just dropped out. And you notice how wide he prepares and uh, how much he uses just the inhale. Yes, isn't it? It's also that he um, has this compressed M mouth, even though the character is not saying M, it's more of a lip smack. And then he has a stretched M there before it pops open. It gives sort of an elastic quality to the lips, um, often we give it. If you have enough time to do it, um, it's good to do in dialogue if you've got like, 
compressed one, like a really squashed one, and then up. The face is starting to stretch, but the mouth is still closed, and then it pops open. You can't do it all the time, because you usually don't have time to do that. But a very big mouth, just for an inhale. I just dropped by. Uh, forgive me if I've interrupted anything. Oh, no. Yeah. But the basic head action is very, very simple. And the dialogue is sort of done within these two two poses, really. Sort of this one and this one back, and then he comes back to the center. Isn't it? I just dropped by. Uh, forgive me if I've interrupted anything. Oh, no. Nothing at all. <laughs> nice squash and stretch going on in the facial features there. Um, knowing which parts of the face to use for that. Which part is the RC in big set? You keep the top of the nose um, set into the skull almost. He uses sort of the nostrils, the cheeks, the eyebrows. But the top of the skull um, really sort of maintains a lot of its integrity as far as being a solid object. Um, and he uses the uh, sort of what would be the fleshy parts of the face. Um, the squash is Yeah, bye. Uh, forgive me if I've interrupted anything. Oh no, nothing at all. Uh, right. <laughs> yeah. This again is quite a simple scene, um, just sort of basic attitudes. Oh no. Oh, no, no. And then <laughs> nothing at all. And then nothing at all. But there's a lot of layering on top of it, there's a lot of head shaking <laughs> going on. Within it, which gives it that sort of immediate quality. <laughs> if these head shakes are on some or something, or three. No, <laughs> nothing at all. I thought perhaps you were entertaining him. It's a perfect scene for good staging. The gag here, obviously, is that you really want to see these claws come out. And uh, the way the animator really makes sure that everybody sees this is just setting it up so far in advance and having really having all the characters that look at where he wants you to look. And keeping everything else basically still so your, your eye tends to go to things that are moving. So, a lot of the scene is basically still. And it comes up. Already you start to look at it. And then both characters are looking at it. The snake is really good. I mean, for a long time before that action takes place, um, there's just no way that you're going to miss it. <laughs> anything? Oh no, nothing at all. I thought perhaps you were entertaining someone up there in your coils. That's <laughs> <laughs> oil. So only after it happens. Just technically on that, on the claw thing, it's just one of those slight pushes slightly further than the usual action. So, bang. Someone up there in your coils. Coils? Someone? Oh, no. I was just curling up for my siesta. But you were singing to someone. Here's a good example of dialogue done within an expression. Say so. He's got this expression going on like this because he's scratching the side of his mouth. I see him. So, look at the mouth preparation he does on the B of butt. There's no sound yet. There's probably no, no B written on the X sheet at this point. But he closes the mouth and six frames before. He needs to open it for the butt. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. And then he pops it open. 
but you singing. <laughs> so even though it's a highly distorted mouth shape because of this expression, you can still get away with saying the word like singing, which you would expect to have a sort of wide shape. But because of the sound of the actor being this very pompous and sort of constricted sounding thing, you can get away with it. It says siesta. But you were singing to someone. Who is it, Carl? Oh. 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 Mistake of trying to put something like that on ones, and um, if you just had one and then an in between on each one, is that you wouldn't get the real sort of pendulum effect of having more frames pointing each way. If you had a bunch of in betweens, you would get all these drawings which were, you know, in the middle of this head shape, and you wouldn't get that snap from either side. So if you were going to in between something like this, you'd have to favor the hell out of each side. Uh, to get it to have that, that pendulum type spacing from that friendship because it's only two friends and two friends. I sing myself to sleep. You know, self hypnosis. Let me show you how it works. A trust in me. <laughs> I know, I can't be bothered with that. I have no time for that sort of nonsense. <laughs> so here we see one of um, Mr. Carl's sort of stock head things that he likes to do. Um, it's this sort of uh, head nod on claws and then his head tilting sort of on claws. And sort of combinations thereof. He likes to do a lot of. Uh, Acting patterns which have little head shakes on them, and they're usually um, sort of four frames between each extreme. <laughs> I, know, I can't be bothered with that. I have no time for that sort of nonsense. So it's, I can't be bothered with that. I have no time for that sort of nonsense. <laughs> um, he varies it a little because he's got this accent nonsense that he wants to hit, so he makes this last one. <laughs> But essentially, it's just a full range of strings. So that's, I can't be bothered with that. And he's, pretty clever, he's pretty clever about timing it so it works with the dialogue. I mean, he's not just slapping it in. Without any skill, but uh, it's definitely something that he does a lot in there. Since long lost that matter. So you can see the head is just rocking like this, and then on nonsense he goes uh, a little farther to, the, to get that accent. 
That's the one where it's all the box and the normal. Um, so probably what he would have done is uh, looked at the X sheet, seen where that dialogue came, and thought, okay, I want to do this little head rocking thing on pause, and planned it backwards from there to know exactly what he wanted to start. Because he knew he wanted to hit that one right there on the last one. Well, I have no time for that sort of nonsense. No time. Perhaps. Perhaps. But at the moment I'm searching for a man cub. Man cub? What man cub? Again, change of expression done within a very tight area of the screen so you don't really miss that change of expression. Man cub. Man cub? What man cub? The one who's lost. Now, where do you suppose he could be? Search me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, we notice the different extremes of the mouth shapes here, how far they're opening compared to the dialogue. Some of them higher than others. Uh, where? But do you is just on a closing chin. It's not where do you, it's where do you. It's not as if the chin goes. One. Now, where do you suppose he could be? So, really, his chin only goes, now, where do you suppose he could be? Like that. And the rest is on his mouth. It might be a little overly simplistic, perhaps. I don't know. Now, where do you suppose he could be? Search me. Up. That's an excellent idea. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't mind showing me your coil. <laughs> I'm sure you wouldn't mind showing me your coils, would you, Carl? And it's got this slight overlapping quality to it. He's used the mouth, the chin, um, as a sort of slightly overlapping element. So, in a sense, the face does just compress and then open up. But it's done in such a way that it overlaps ever so slightly just on like two frames or something. So it's just this slight little sort of concertina effect. Um, so it doesn't have this three drawing scene look. It doesn't have just this there, there, there with just a bunch of in-between. It has this slight sort of overlapping quality to it, which means a few partial drawings need to be done with just like the chin. You do not obey the charts to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> My sinuses. Now that, on the first glance, this sort of snorting, freaking out thing, on the first glance looks like quite a spontaneous action. Something which you would think, oh gosh, maybe you need to do that straight ahead. If you look at it, though, um, it actually does have a pattern to it that you can break down. You can feel the animal that it's doing here. So, I mean, first of all, he's got this, this simple take. This is just a look out, basically. But then to do this snorting thing, he has a couple of daggers and then some sort of nostril head locking thing that he does. 
there's, there's a definite pattern to it. So here's, here's the first one. There. So it's just staggering back into that first pose. There. And then there's another one. There. There. Like that. Eyes are fully open on the breakdown. So it's right. The breakdown is that one. It's the eyes fully open and the mouth is just closed. So if you just in between this, the mouth would be still slightly open and the eyes would be sort of half closed in there, and the brows would be further up than they are. So you've got this sort of effect that the brows are coming down slightly sooner than the mouth is closing, so it's not all just compressing at the same rate. It's got a little bit of a sort of staggered feeling to it, which is done by clever charting and putting that break down there. <laughs> eyes white, <coughs> his eyes come open. My sinuses. Oh. <clears throat> really? 
right I love this matchup you beginning really And again, it's not really, it's just really with the chin, but you see his tongue goes up to the roof of his mouth to do the L sound. Raven. Oh, there. Well, if you do just happen to see the man cub, you will inform me first. Understand? I get the point. Cross my heart. Hope to die. Good show. And now I must continue my search for the helpless little. Okay, so, um, that's a pretty good sequence, I think, just for uh, its success in catching every little thing that the animator does. And so often you can do things which just get lost and work so hard on them. No one has to really see them as a product. Um, knowing the restraint how much time things are going to take, how much build-up they really need for you to see them really, really clearly. Um, I'll illustrate it here. Um, next time, we'll next couple of years, human locomotion. Um, human locomotion, I suppose, is for semi-realistic animation. Just normal cartoon walks can be pretty simple, but once you start getting into what actually happens to like a human skeleton when it walks and runs, um, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, all I'd like to do is show a lot of footage of real people and then I'll try and boil it down, explain exactly what's happening. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how to adapt that animation. So, walks. Walking. Let's see. Um, all this, a lot of the stuff I'm going to say today will refer back to a lot of the stuff I said the first week, uh, just about basic mechanics. So, there'll be a lot of slow in, slow out, a lot of attention to the weight, and, uh, and so on. The inertia. Okay, basic walk. Um, some people have described a walk as like a controlled fall, like uh, what you're really doing is catching yourself from falling over and just trying to take a step. Um, and really, I suppose the basic point about walking is that it's sort of a bouncing ball type action. It's sort of a soft bouncing ball. Um, the weight of your body and all. Let's say, like, the top of your head follows this kind of path in the way it is. It's a little bit exaggerated. Um, where it's not really exactly like a bouncing ball, it's like this. You know, it's just real definite bounces on it. And again, it's not really like a, it doesn't have the same dip on the bottom as it does on the top. It's a little bit sharper on the bottom than it is on the top. Just to catch ourselves with the weight of changes. Okay. Now, a, a real human walk, the amount of up and down is not really very much, which is why if you're trying to trace it off live action, it's real easy to miss it. Um, but it's always good to know exactly what's going on so you can choose to push it. The amount of up and down is like a real human walk. Um, the forward progression is dead even. Unless you're doing something very specialized in terms of the walk or something like that, you're actually doing something that makes sense. Speeding up and slowing down every step. Apart from that, it's an even progression. Um, so there's slightly more time spent at the top than there is at the bottom. 
so then what happens is obviously in a walk you've got both feet contacting the ground at the same time for a certain place on it. If it was just one foot then it would be a front. Um, so you have obviously a phase of the action where both feet are contacting the ground. Then there's a phase of the action where this foot lifts on. A phase where this leg is just suspended. And then you've got both feet coming down again. Um, this varies on what type of walk it is. Uh, depending on how much time you spend with both feet on the ground. But like that sneak that I just did has a lot of time with both feet on the ground, but the time that the leg actually spends going through is pretty short. But normally on a walk, what happens is when this heel strikes, that heel takes off. That's pretty much what happens when you just start walking in. You can see that the uh, contact position which is, I'll get onto that in a minute, it's a good way to plan out animations in the The contact drawing, which is really here. And this heel just has just come off the ground, and this heel has just touched it. And the contact is on the way down. So, like the suspended phase is in here, we are going over the top. The leg is swinging through. Contact is on the way down. Then this is the squash and then the weight goes on. Just that. Just that first glance. So just dealing with the legs. That's sort of basic action. Um, in a sort of cartoony type walk. Um, or anything else type like thing. The feet can like follow up a path like that. Pick up and put down into a simple arm. In, uh, in real life, <coughs> real human walks, the path is a little bit more complicated. What happens really is that it's a lift up, swing through, and plant. It's a shape that is real. The foot comes off the ground, it swings through, and like that. Um, and this is really sort of a function of how our skeletons are built, which makes it do this. It's easier to follow this sort of thing in sort of computer or puppet animation because the model won't let you do anything else with it. Um, but it's easier to get into sort of simplified versions like this when you're just drawing it. That's a cheap way to shrink and stretch. Um, but this is actually what happens to a real human foot when it swings through. So what happens is it sits there, it lifts off, the heel comes high like that, as the knee bends, and then as it starts to swing through, it comes very, very low to the ground. And as it straightens out, it starts to, the foot starts to flip up, usually, it goes down a little bit. And then it the like that. So it's a lift up, swing through, and climb. Um, and this happens because the sort of pendulum nature of the leg swinging through, and the fact that it's got a knee joint. So, this action is not too dissimilar to the action of something that's waving around like this, like a falling tree type action. It's not too dissimilar to that because it lifts up and swings through. Yeah. So, really, that's the sort of um, I think it's fun to have a look at some of the books. Larry at First Castle. It's fun to see. Normal striding walk. It's got a purpose to it. It's pretty average, really. You know, it's not like really trying. It's not it's going slowly. And if you just watch it, it's pretty hard to really see the ups and downs in it. And 
And that's the sort of thing you would lose if you were trying to roto it. If you weren't like really, really careful. So, we start on the contact drawing, contact position. Um, in other words, the legs are at their furthest extent apart, so the arms actually. One heel has just come off the ground, the other one has just touched it. And both legs are pretty much dead straight. <coughs> the weight goes on, the knee bends slightly, the impact, as it absorbs the impact of his body. And the other foot comes off the ground. Then he comes to his high point, where he's the tallest, just in here, pretty much there, it's like the high point, where his weight is sort of on that toe at the back there. Rising. And then he starts to come down and into another contact position. Just a slight flex of the knee, and then it pretty much straightens out again immediately. So there's a strange little thing that happens is that the back leg is straight, it bends quite a lot as it swings through, it straightens out just for an instant, really for like two or one frame before it starts to bend again with the impact there. So it's really a swing through and straight and then it bends again just because of So it's just that one instant where both legs are dead straight. But if you didn't know where those ups and downs were, you might miss them in a realistic world. So there's not too much time spent with both feet on the ground. It's really just by the time his entire foot is on the ground at the front there, the other one's only got like a couple more frames to go before it's off the front already. Okay, notice also how close his feet come to the ground on that swing through. I'll show you another clip. Exactly You'll know that if you're walking lazily, you're liable to scuff your feet on the ground at that point in the walk. You'll get that little <laughs> as it hits the ground. You know, it's going like dragging your feet, basically. So, in other words, walking is not like a real picking up, you're lifting it right over. But watch John Boyd's feet at the left there. You can see what I mean. Is that the highest point of the foot is at the back of the stroke. So his foot lifts up quite high there yeah, and swings through like a pendulum. And the heel comes real close to the ground as it swings through. Yeah, and then it plants. So his toe sort of flips up before it plants like that. And it comes real close to the ground. It doesn't happen, it's just it is actually almost as well. You watch his feet. There's really good, like, no time when both feet are on the ground. He's almost jogging. Yeah. Nice shot. It really shows the contrast in their characters. close together his feet are, John Boyd's feet. They're not only close to the ground when they swing through, but really close to each other. And that's the other thing you'll notice if you're walking lazily, is that you're liable to hit your other leg as it swings through. What I'm saying is, what you see often, or what I see often in animation, which doesn't quite work for me, is uh, people walking on railroad tracks. People really walk when they're striding sort of normally. This is the thing to do with balance more than anything else. They tend to walk pretty much on either side of a tightrope. 
really. They plant their heels just on either side of the paper thin line, basically. Um, sometimes you might turn the feet slightly out, depending on what type of walk it is, you turn the feet slightly in. Um, I usually tend to turn the feet ever so slightly out for most characters. Um, but like regular people you know, tend to walk on either side of a very, very narrow line. Um, if you do animation and plan it out so both your feet are traveling on like separate curves like that, um, you get what I call walking on railroad tracks, which looks worse and worse the slower the, the, slower the person is walking. And, uh, that's because the slower you walk, the more underneath you you have to put your feet because your supporting foot really has to balance you during the phase of the walk because you're going so slowly over it. The slower I go, I not only have to place my feet on either side of the tightrope, I actually have to place them in front of each other. You know, if I'm going to do this, otherwise I can walk. If I'm trying to walk like this, I have to do it really fast in order to in order to get away with it. If I'm to do this slowly and, and try and keep my body on one line, you just fall over. The only way to walk with your legs, you know, at a slow pace, with your legs spaced like this, is this. It's all a weight and balance thing. Which can be useful if you're doing something which you're carrying like a heavy weight or something. You know, it can be something that you can use. But in normal locomotion, running, walking, um, everything. Either side of the very, very narrow line. Um, let's talk a little bit about. Let's get into the little bit. Let's talk about the hips. Um, there's like three different things really which go on with the hips uh, when you're walking. They go up and down. You know, if you do it in context, space, they do this, obviously. They swivel like that, so when this foot's forward, they tilt it out so it's like this. When that foot's forward, they tilt it out so it's like that. So they do this. They also do this very, very slightly. When, when really all skeletons move, they tend to hang off the limb that's supporting them. So in other words, if the weight is on this foot, and the other one is passing through. The skeleton, this is gross in the room, by the way, for realistic humans, but if you want to you want to continue a bit, or what type of walk there's more swagger and John Brown and so the, uh, the skeleton has to hang off of the points that are supporting it. Um, you'll notice that. We'll do animals with them next week, but you notice that amazingly at the shoulders of big cats. And the weight is hanging off the one that's supporting them. The shoulder blade like, sticks way up high on, on the one that's on the ground. And the other one that's swinging through, the shoulder blade is low, the, the whole limb is contracted. And then the weight goes onto this one, that one sticks way up high. So, really, sort of think of the skeleton as like a bridge or like a house or something where it sort of hangs off the supports. So, all in all, the pelvis, you know, in real life, pretty subtle, does this weird sort of thing where it's, it's sort of doing this, basically, where it's got an up and down, sort of like it's throwing both directions, so it's got an up and down, it's got an up and side, it's got the tail. Now, really all of these things are pretty subtle. And, um, the reason why um, they're a little bit different in men and women is that women, in terms of their height, tend to have wider hips than men. So what happens when women walk slowly is that they tend to have to compensate for sort of the width of the weight out there by pushing that hip out a little bit more when this foot is on the ground and pushing it out 
that way a little bit more than the other people up and down. You know, that's where we get that. So, yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> we should have seen Russell Hall do this one. Well, yeah. um, and why women to look more womanly, to look, look sexier, accentuates that. And that one would want to do that in animation is to almost uh, get to it. It's a balance thing. More things than that. Um, so they tend to do this more <coughs> as well as men. They tend to keep the lips so more slightly rigid. Um, let's see, that's hips. Uh, now, this is actually what really happens. In most animation, it can really be too subtle for you to ever see. You know, if you're trying to describe a character with a couple of lines, you, know, you can get into all sorts of trouble if you're really trying to um, put in every single one of these motions. The more the details you've really got on a character, this is an animation point in general. Um, the subtler your animation is going to have to be. Um, that's why computer rendered. Uh, you know, CGI characters can either render the texture match, or you can see every single little shift that's going on in the model. Okay, so you're going to have to be more careful about putting in the right amount of swivel, rotation, but I'm not just putting in a simple hit. You know, it's a little bit more subtle about it because the audience is going to see it. If you're just dealing with outline, flat color, you know, as most of us do, you can pretty much get away with just a little bit of a swivel like this, but coming up and down. So you can worry about that. It should really be an attitude. Upper body. In all locomotion people, the upper body really is there to counteract the lower body. So to keep you from falling out of what happens with your upper body and your arms. Um, that's why when this leg is forward, this arm is forward. When your hips are swiveling this way, your shoulders tend to swivel this way. Like counteracting motion. Because if you try and do both legs together, you, know, you start getting <laughs> way out of control. Um, you can do it slowly, you know, if you do something slow enough, you can get away with anything. But um, faster you try and do something like that, you're just going to get out of control because the weight won't let you. Stop moving. The inertia in your the weight of your body will do that. That's why you do the opposite thing with your arm. Um, so, speed is uh, a factor in this. Like I just said, the slower you go, the more you can get away with it. So, if I go really, really slow, I can not do it happen. I can just keep my upper body completely stiff because there's, no, there's not enough inertia for me to counteract to the weight of my leg. But somebody running, trying to do this, it's very much harder for them to really run at speed to keep their arms down or your shoulders straight. Well, it's really hard. That's why you have to pump your arms more the faster you go when you're running. Um, so shoulders doing this, arms doing this. You can do a variety of things with arms depending on what kind of walk you're trying to do. You can do simple just swing throughs where the elbows are a little bit flexed if I bend a bit more on the way back, straighten out a little bit more on the way through. You might get a little bit more elaborate if it's a very sort of, sort of attitude type thing where there's a snap at the bottom where it snaps straight and bends it at each end, like that. There's all sorts of things you can do depending on the attitude of the ball. But the factor is that it has to be opposite of the way. Um, so, the walk all put together.